most people with Asperger's and high functioning autism have emotional and behavioral problems, quite honestly, to one degree or another. And these challenges are most often related to social skills deficits associated with the disorder. Social difficulties frequently involve feelings of anxiety, loss of control, and the inability to predict outcomes. So as a result, these individuals usually have problems connected to their inability to function in the world that they see as threatening and unpredictable. The individual who feels generally fearful or anxious or confused will typically act out these troubling emotions in rather destructive ways. And as you say, in the form of tantrums, meltdowns, shutdowns, and even aggression at times. And so it's not uncommon for, in this case, the neurotypical wife to view the individual with Asperger's as mean-spirited, malicious, selfish, uncaring, and so on. When your husband with Asperger's syndrome experiences emotional issues, behavioral difficulties, whatever you want to call it, his problems are most often associated with his defensive panic reaction, social incompetence, sensory sensitivities, or an obsessive interest in a particular topic. Because people with Asperger's tend to be cut off from their feelings, they obtain facts and information without understanding how those facts can be applied to real life situations. Also, due to being detail oriented, they often miss the overall picture and apply the same level of detail to every situation, whether appropriate or not. And you may have run into a situation where people outside of the home view your Asperger's husband as just a normal person uh, with no apparent behavioral or emotional issues. They may perceive him as having both fewer and less significant deficits than you do. This disparity is often due to the fact that the person with Asperger's or high function autism appears, and there's the key term, he appears to perform as well as neurotypical individuals with the exception of social competency and with the exception of emotional reciprocity with his significant other. Other areas that individuals with Asperger's syndrome experience difficulty would be concrete and literal thinking styles, difficulty in discerning relevant from irrelevant stimuli, inflexibility, difficulties in the areas of problem solving and language-based critical thinking, obsessive and narrowly defined interests, weakness in comprehending verbally presented information, poor organization skills, difficulties in arriving at logical solutions to routine and real life problems, and problems in applying skills and knowledge to solve problems. It is very common for people in a relationship with somebody with Asperger's syndrome to fail to recognize their special needs because they often give the impression that they understand more than they do. And furthermore, certain strengths of the disorder may actually mask the deficits. Now, I know at some level, everything that I just laid out here may sound like a litany of excuses as to why your Asperger's husband behaves the way that he does. But I've been very cautious in this presentation to only include those things that may appear childish. In other words, these traits that I've listed throughout this video do indeed, on occasion, give the impression that the individual is acting very immaturely, which shouldn't be surprising because Asperger's is a developmental disorder. In other words, developmentally, they are socially and emotionally lagging compared to their chronological age. So in that sense, some of this behavior can be said to be somewhat childish. You as a female neurotypical, your brain is highly social. Your emotional intelligence is super high. And unfortunately, the individual with Asperger's syndrome is on the other end of that spectrum. But that's not to say they're not intelligent. In fact, most people with Asperger's are much smarter and logical than the average neurotypical. So now we wanna look at why an individual isolated problem that could occur later this afternoon may feel so much worse than it actually is. So when there is a relationship problem, we'll just say there's an argument over something that's important to one or perhaps both parties, and there is a heated exchange, hurtful things are said and done, and it's uh, in some cases just a brutal blowout. In retrospect, when you look back on that argument or that event, there's two memories. There's the content memory and the emotional memory. The content memory is what was said, and the emotional memory is how you felt during that argument. So when you're reflecting on that argument, 
maybe a week later or even a month later, you have content memory and emotional memory. So every time you remember that fight, we will say, this verbal fight, you also feel the same negative emotions that you felt during that episode. And if you revisit the memory of that argument two, three, four, twelve times, each time you're going to feel just as bad as you did in the moment. And so even though the event only happened once, it feels as though it's happened twelve times because you replayed that video in your head of the event, and each time you play it, each time you remember it, you feel it. And the other reason that a current isolated problem can feel so much worse than it actually is, is due to this cumulative effect of unresolved problems. If you're like most couples that I work with, you stop talking about problems because your conflict resolution skills as a couple sucked. Not only did you not get the problem solved, you just irritated and frustrated one another even worse than you were before you came into the discussion. So there's this pile of problems that just goes in the closet and that pile is getting really tall. And so then a, a problem comes up that let's say is a level three on a scale of one to 10, 10 being very severe. So relative to some of the other problems, a level three problem is not a big deal. But when you throw it on top of an existing pile of problems, now you have the straw that can break the camel's back. So this is why it's imperative to come up with a communication strategy that you can use that doesn't end in a disaster because you're gonna remember the disaster. And each time you recall it, it's gonna make it feel worse. And each time you have a problem that goes unresolved, if you guys don't talk about a problem, you don't forget about the problem. It just goes in the in the filing cabinet called unresolved problems. And when that list gets too long, both parties lose their confidence in their ability to problem solve, which even furthers the likelihood that they won't even attempt it. And now we're in trouble because you have a couple, both of which feel like they're always walking on thin ice. So in summary, the reason that a rather mild problem could feel like a super bad problem is due to the emotional memory factor and the cumulative effect of unresolved problems factor. With emotions blindness, sometimes it's hard for for these guys to empathize. It's not that they don't want to empathize. And it's not that they don't have empathy. They rarely have displayed empathy, but so let's make that distinction. So with emotions blindness, it's really hard to empathize. You get a pass on that to a degree from me. Maybe not from her, but let's make the distinction between, at least in my opinion, between empathy and compassion. Empathy is, I understand exactly how you're feeling. That's going to be a hard one for you. Compassion is, I may not know necessarily how you are feeling or why you're feeling that way, but you're important to me and I want to do whatever I can do to reduce your suffering. That's the difference between empathy and compassion. You may have a hard time empathizing, but you will not have a hard time unless you just choose not to really care. You won't have a hard time with compassion, which again is, I'm not sure why you're distraught. And even when you tell me why you're distraught, it doesn't seem to quite make logical sense to me. But if you say you're distraught, you're distraught, and I want, I care about this marriage, and I'm going to employ compassion, which is, what can I do to reduce your suffering? So you don't get a pass on that one at all. You can be in the business of being compassionate without necessarily being full tilt, pedal to the metal in the business of empathy. But you didn't sign up for autism. It was imposed upon you by the universe. It's not your fault that you have it. You're wired differently. It causes a lot of fucking problems in a person's life when they have it. That doesn't give you an excuse to just go, okay, well, I just have it. And so now she's just going to have to deal. It's just one of these traits, you know, and you're just going to have to learn to live with it. That's not what I'm saying. You are responsible for your thoughts, your feelings, and your behavior. But you did not precipitate this autism. 
You were one of the lucky ones that just happened to get it. So it's not your fault that you have it. And it's not your fault that you have this anxiety that makes you engage in all of these ridiculous anxiety reduction strategies that cause a problem in your relationship. You need to give yourself some self-compassion. Compassion is, what, tell me what I need to do that, that's within my power to do to reduce your suffering. Sign me up, I'm all in. Self-compassion now is you're gonna turn that around and put it on you. So when you're feeling down, you're gonna to try to approach your feelings with curiosity and openness rather than chastising yourself or feeling a particular way. Um, you're gonna be more tolerant of your own flaws, if we wanna call it a flaw, deficit, challenge, whatever term you wanna use. You're gonna to try to be understanding and patient towards the certain traits of the disorder that you don't like. There's some traits that you have and they ain't going anywhere. So you're gonna to try to be understanding of the fact that these are the traits that came with the thing I have and I'm gonna be you know, more understanding and patient with myself when I ha exhibit those traits. You're gonna be kind to yourself when you're experiencing suffering. And you also need to fully re recognize, Rick, that um, this is a huge part of the human condition. There's not just a few dozen people that have Asperger's syndrome. We're talking millions and millions and millions. And we're only talking this within this generation. If we wanted to go back to uh, Rex's dad and Rex's dad's dad, we could go back four or five generations and we would be talking perhaps billions of people who have had autism and never knew it. So the other thing is you got to remember that you're not the only one that has this. This is more common then we know because some people don't want to get a diagnosis and some people don't even know that they are on the autism spectrum so wouldn't even think about a diagnosis so during uh, when you are tempted as you will be to beat up on yourself you're going to treat yourself with the same kindness and respect that you would with a cherished friend somewhere i'm sure you have a friend maybe it's your wife or somebody or you wouldn't treat them the same way you treat you, would you? And then the other thing you need to remember is you're not alone. There's many others going through the same thing. So if I have mind blindness and I don't really understand why people think the way they do, and I have alexithymia and I don't understand why they feel the way they do, and I have some of these executive functions deficits, I am by default gonna have the fourth and final thing that we're gonna talk about here in the big four, and that's anxiety. I don't understand why people think the way they do, why they have these goofy opinions and perspectives on stuff. I don't understand why they feel the way they do. And when my NTY says, well, I feel this way about such and such, he might have the thought, well, why the hell would you feel like that? I know what happened and you feel this way based on what happened. I don't, I don't get why you would feel that way. And, and the, maybe I'm forgetting things or maybe I have some meltdowns or shutdowns or whatever. I have a huge amount of anxiety and predictability in my life. A huge amount of unpredictability. Life seems to be very chaotic in the social and emotional sense. Very random in the social and emotional sense. So life is so unpredictable, I have to create predictability. How am I gonna do that? I'm gonna insist on routine. I'm going to have to have structure to manage my day. I'm going to hate change, especially surprise change. How is she going to download that? He, he's very rigid, one track mind, stubborn, can't shift gears. Just hyper, this, this, this one thing all the time. Um, how would she download mind blindness? where you have a hard time with perspective taking. He doesn't care about my opinions. How would your NT wife download alexithymia? He doesn't care about my feelings. My feelings aren't important to him. Uh, how would she download, for example, working memory deficit? Uh, the stuff that I ask him to do is important to me. It's not important to him. He's free for kids. So, so you've been labeled uh, unfairly. I don't know what she's labeled you. Insensitive, uncaring, selfish, narcissistic, sociopathic. What else? What else did she label you with? 
and I'm not faulting her. She, if she's not educated about ASD, she doesn't know what she's working with. And uh, she probably was doing the best that she knew how to do, given the circumstances. I'm sure her heart was in the right place. I'm sure her intentions were good. She cares about the marriage. She's worked hard on keeping it together. She's worked too hard. She's worked so hard that you're always feeling like you're in fix-it mode. And in some cases, she's become your number one source of anxiety, which makes the back problem worse because now when she wants to have the talk, your anxiety instantly goes up and maybe you just, some. I, I hear from guys all the time, I spend most of my time just trying to avoid her. And uh, the, the problems keep piling up in the closet. And whenever I uh, have a problem with a difficult conversation and either I can't follow it, uh, I'm not, I'm trying to listen to what she says, but I'm not hearing everything. And what I am hearing, I'm not fully understanding. And what I'm understanding, I'm not fully retaining. And what I'm, what I am retaining, my, it's hard to really know how to follow through with what she wants. And so there's this huge communication gap. And then she just downloads that as, again, you just don't care. This is the NT wife's classic statement. We can't talk about anything. The problems just keep piling up over there in the closet. If you have ASD level one, there's gonna be some blind spots. There's gonna be some, some executive function challenges, all of which result in anxiety. And that makes trying to problem solve when there's a bunch of social and emotional nuances involved. Very difficult.